Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Ask the Expert. Today, we are here with a truly special, very interesting, and inspirational psychologist, Dr. Anne Marie Albano. She is known for her research on treating anxiety and mood disorders and their impact on youth. She's a professor of medical psychology at Columbia University and is the founding director of its Clinic for Anxiety and Related Disorders. Her work has been influential in many places, including several treatment manuals, and she's published several award-winning self-help books. Are you ready for these subjects? Ones that I think a lot of us can relate to. How Parents Can Free Their Children from Fears and Worries how to help children with extensive shyness learn how to cope, and how to help with children with school refusal behavior. If you haven't listened to it yet, she has an amazing TED Talk on how to raise kids who can overcome anxiety. Dr. Albano is an amazing advocate for mental health awareness and has dedicated her career to the importance of mental health for healthy childhood development. As a parent, I wish I could have had this conversation with Dr. Albano years ago, but I know this will help so many out there, especially at times like this when anxiety is at an all-time high. We are so excited to have Dr. Albano answer the most common questions she receives on anxiety. So let's just get started. Dr. Albano, welcome, and we're so happy to have you. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So can we just start with the basics? What We talk about anxiety a lot, and I hear a lot of times people confuse stress with anxiety or we you know, bundle them together. Sometimes we bundle anxiety with depression. What is anxiety and what does it feel like when you have it? That's a great question, and you're exactly right. Things get mixed up all together. Let's start with this. Anxiety is a basic, fundamental human emotion that is in all of us. And in fact, anxiety is part of our nervous system. We have these inborn alarms that are in our brain that help us to sort of search and be aware of when something threatening and dangerous can happen. So if you just think back to before civilizations were around and we were just out there in the wild, the brain was working in such a way to search and make sure that the human was aware of whether they were going to be taken home for dinner by some dinosaur or animal, whether they were going to be able to get their dinner by, you know, getting something, or if they needed to just flee and run away, fight, flight, or, or uh, flee. And so that's what anxiety is. It's these inborn alarms that were there and have been there evolutionarily, but we don't really need them the way that, that we used to, you know? While right now we're in an extraordinary time with a pandemic, in a normal day, you get up and there are things that stress you out, and especially with kids, homework, friendships and making and meeting friends, uh, you know, maybe getting called on in class. Sure, those things cause your anxiety to rise a little bit. They should. That's where anxiety motivates you to do what you need to do to get things done. But if those alarms really go off, And homework is like, oh my gosh, it's the same thing as a saber-toothed tiger coming after you and you're all stressed and upset. No, that's anxiety going out of control a bit, right? So what does anxiety feel like to us? It should feel like butterflies in your stomach when you're asking someone you like out for a date. And it should feel like your heart pounding if you're being called on in front of the whole class. But it shouldn't overwhelm you where that happens again and again and again so much that you can't turn it off and you're constantly have a lump in your throat or you're shaking and trembling. You're losing sleep. You can't concentrate on what's going on because you're afraid you're going to get in trouble or make a mistake. That's when anxiety gets out of control. Wow. What an interesting and elegant way to frame that. So it's like everybody can feel anxious. And that's a normal part of life. But when it gets to a point that it's out of control or that it's having major effects on you, that that is what we consider anxiety. That's right. And the way I explain it to kids and parents these days is we all carry anxiety around because like I said, it's a normal part of us. And we want to think of it like we're going on an airplane. You want your anxiety to fit in your overhead bag 
and fit in the thing, you know, in the bin on top and maybe slide it up in front of you under the seat, but not that it's falling out on the aisles and hitting the person in front of you. When you have too much anxiety, other people can tell oftentimes you're asking the teacher again and again, can you help me? I don't understand. Can I, is this the way to do this? You're constantly running into your parents' room in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, you're calling your friends and checking on things or you're afraid to do things. That's too much. That's the bags are too full. They're busting open. So we want to bring that in under your control again. Be packaged nicely so it works for you instead of against you. I love the analogy of the airplane because it's so, so, so visual and you can see it. So when it comes to kids and anxiety, how often is it that the child or the adolescents themselves acknowledges that they have anxiety or is it the people around them like their parents or their teachers? Well, that's also a very good question because the interesting thing is we know that children can suffer with an anxiety disorder uh, for two to seven years before someone calls it to their attention to get help. Wow. And the reason why is because we do, you know, you have to think about things, tough it out, you know, be, be a big boy or a big girl. Um, we tend to not recognize anxiety readily because it's so internal. You don't know if someone has butterflies. You don't know how much they're suffering inside and what they're saying to themselves. And so we do know these conditions begin very early. By age four or five, children can have anxiety disorders. We know they grow in prevalence over time. And so the more it goes on, we have to have parents and also teachers and others around pay attention to what the children are doing. And if they're not doing the things that are typical for kids, ah, that's when we want to worry about them. So I got to ask this question, and, and there may or may not be a right answer, but where does it come from, you know, on the nature-nurture kind of scale? Are these things that we're born with? Are these things that, as parents, we do to our kids? Where, or is it a combination of both? Well, I'm, but this, you just asked the question that I actually built a program around for parents. And part of that is, are these things that we are that we are born with? Well, the answer is, in essence, yes. Yes, in that because we all have nervous systems and because they function in a way, as I said, with normal human emotions, anxiety being one of the major ones, it's there. So anxiety is there. Anxiety de does tend to run in families. So there are, we think, some, you know, biological bases, some genetics that contribute to the risk for anxiety. So that may be there. You can, you know, think about it, you know, grandma who maybe didn't leave the house or the uncle who wouldn't drive on the highway. There's many different ways we can think about family members in the distant past and stuff and those close to us who have had anxiety. But the question I really want to get at is, did I do this to my child? And my answer to parents is no, you did not do this to your child. No. Now, what happens? Think about this. When you see your child, four or five years of age, crying because they weren't included in a game on the playground or because they did something that embarrassed themselves, maybe they wet themselves at school, you know, in, in a preschooler, or they forgot their homework and they got embarrassed. When you see your child crying, what do you want to do as a parent? Cuddle them, hold them, take the pain away. Exactly. Right. We want to fix it. We want to comfort them. We want to reassure them. And especially when it's things that they get embarrassed about or they cry about, you know, we want to make it better for them. So what happens is the more a parent tends to do that over time, if the child doesn't have the opportunity to struggle and learn how to problem solve and deal for themselves, it's not that the parent causes the anxiety or makes it worse. It's just it allows the anxiety to stay, to stay in the picture. So, for example, a little kid who comes home crying, you know, the girls wouldn't sit with me at school today. Nobody would talk to me. And the parent goes in the next day, talks to the teacher, and the teacher makes arrangements that the, her child is, you know, the kids are playing with her nicely. Okay, at four years old or five years old. But if your child keeps coming home, no one would play with me. 
I didn't get asked to do this. I want to go there, but I don't know how to ask anyone at eight, at 10, at 14, if the parent is still intervening and arranging things, then the child doesn't learn the skills to manage on their own. So that's where it's not that you're causing anxiety. What we want to do is we want to step back and get control of your anxiety. What you worry about is mom or dad stepping in and say, wait, what do I want to teach my child in terms of these types of situations and how to handle them themselves as they age? That makes that makes so much sense. And so it's like the reaction to things is is almost more important than the stem of where they came from. What worries me is I like I have a high schooler, I have a senior in high school, and the anxiety around college is so great. And being that it's my third kid and he's a really smart kid, like the child is going to go to college. Like there's no doubt. And where he goes isn't gonna define what he's gonna do. And and exactly. I know that as a parent. But the level of anxiety that's put on these kids, especially these kind of high performers, it's insane. And I just, I, so I personally, I feel for it. I, what I feel for it as a parent, it's every stage. It's like, you know, you just, you know, it, you know, as a parent and you've seen it, if you're not a parent with your friends, but it's every stage it's, you know, are they walking at the right time? Are they talking at the right time? And this person's kid's making better sentences and this kid's, you know, and then you get through preschool and you get to elementary school. I mean, with each stage is, and then you add the physical piece on top of it and the, you know, this one's athletic and this one's not athletic. And so there's just so many places in life. It feels like you could have a a inherent natural disposition to anxiety, and then you can layer on it maybe some sacrifices or circumstances in your life that could make you even feel more anxiety. And then there's just life itself, which can be anxiety provoking. But I love what you said earlier about this isn't life or death, and this isn't, you know, fight or flight, but yet. I think we, we sometimes make it and I, I'll just, I'm going to stop my rant here in a second, I promise. But no, part, no, of keep what, going. <laughs> part of what I worry about too is that during this pandemic, when we're all so isolated and kids who are meant to be connected and meant to be with each other and to play, they're isolated. I think it, it feels like that creates more anxiety or maybe anxiety is the wrong word, but more internal focus on themselves that's almost not as normal as there's there's not as much kind of natural buffering of kind of feedback and just it's a lot of time to ruminate if you want about whatever it is like my kid would be college where I don't think normally if you're in school and with friends you have less time to focus so I I that was a, a long-winded question really <laughs> but I'm just curious if uh, as we've go gone on and expectations have been greater is that creating more anxiety okay I want to unpack a lot of what you said because <laughs> You, you really, you really nailed it really nicely in a big package here. But let's 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 start with a few things. One is the environment and context is so critical. Yes, uh, the kids will have anxiety and they'll have times when it's higher and lower during the course of development. And you know, the fifth grader has a different type of anxiety than the than the ninth grader who has a different type of anxiety in terms of what causes anxiety from the 12th grader or from the kid in college. The key for parents is recognizing that there are uh, tasks and challenges to life, as we all know, that happen throughout adulthood. I mean, I'm sorry, that happen throughout childhood and adolescence. And the kids have to learn how to manage new challenges from learning how to change classes, pick classes, pick extracurriculars on their own, advocate for themselves with their teachers and so forth. These things all cause anxiety. So helping kids to problem solve, not giving them the answer and telling them how, and not judging them for whether they do something that's, you know, doesn't work out well, that is important. And you will have your child with you, telling you what's going on and asking you for your guidance all the way through if you refrain from judging and trying to over control or over protect them. 
they'll come home and they'll say, you know, this happened and I chose X and it didn't work out. What do you think? Can I do Y or Z? And you could say, yeah, let's weigh that. All right. So that's a key to helping them learn how to overcome things and helping them to learn how to manage anxiety and not develop it a dependency on you or the idea that I can't do things because they've got to change all the way through the environments, the context, everything gets mixed up and moves along. It gets more complex from elementary to middle to high school to college and beyond. All right. So that's number one. The second, one of the other things you talk about is with the pandemic, We've seen a number of different things happening with kids who have anxiety already, and now they're at home um, and they're doing online school. And one of the biggest things we're seeing is they feel relief from not having to be in the classroom. Relief is the enemy of the good. Is that the way to say it? Relief, when you feel relief, oh, I'm glad that cocktail party was canceled because you know, I really don't know what to say around those people. They, they're more successful than me. Or I'm glad I didn't have to go that appointment with that doctor. I don't want to hear if there's any bad news. Relief is not a good thing. These are things that say that's a challenge for me. And same with a kid. I am so glad I don't have to walk into that school where I'm always called on or I, I worry about being uh, embarrassed in front of others or I get mixed up and forget things and then I feel behind. So the kids with anxiety are able to hide again. They're pulling their heads into their shells. They're turtles. And they're the ones who are getting forgotten. When it comes to going back to the classroom, what we found since they shut down in March and the kids who had to go back in the fall the ones who had anxiety previously were tougher to get back into school, all right? The big way to combat anxiety is counterintuitive to what you think, but it's what we know. You fall off a horse, you got to get back on it. We have to help kids get into the situations they're afraid of and learn how to manage the anxiety they have, which may be completely natural and normal for that situation, but learn how to override it. And, and let it be there while you still perform or manage and handle a situation. Come on. Uh, you know, one of the things with my young adults, they're always like, I'm not dating anyone. I can't date anyone. I'm too anxious to date anyone. And I ask them, what happens when you or see someone you're attracted to? I want to talk to them, but I get these butterflies and I feel like I'm going to vomit and I'm all sweaty. And I'm like, you want that feeling. That's called attraction. And oh my gosh, <laughs> you know. It, feel, it is anxious. It's anxiety. Yeah, but our nervous systems can only do one certain thing and, and you want to ride that. So they use those kinds of feelings, the feeling when you get called on, <gasps> that feeling, they use that as a signal for I've got to avoid this. When we know if they stuck with it and that person they're attracted to talks back to them and they talk to them and there's a conversation and let's have lunch and whoop, whoop, it leads to things. If they give the talk and they get feedback and they improve and they keep going. If they keep with it and ride that wave, then they're surfing in a really great way into these situations. But even a surfer will tell you it's still shaky, but they ride it. And that's what we want our kids to learn how to do. So we though being out of school and being on Zoom has not been helpful to the kids with anxiety. So we have to, we're doing different things to get them connected and stay in, you know, in con contact with friends, with peers, with teachers so that they'll ease into school again when it opens up full time. So it, I was, you kind of got, got to me into a great spot here for the next question, because I was going to say, okay, we've identified anxiety and what it is and how it, how it happens, but then what do you do about it? And you've mentioned two really good things. One of them is to not judge and to not solve the problem, to, to really empower kids to solve the problems themselves. And you laid out very well the repercussions of continuing to solve the problems, which I, I like to talk in terms of meta messages, but the meta message with that is you, you aren't capable of solving your own problem. And so therefore yes. you need me to solve it, which can create greater anxiety. So I, I really like that. The other one that you talked about, which is forcing yourself into the situation that makes you feel uncomfortable. And um, 
you know, that seems very intuitive, right? I mean, you, you know, you think about like, if you don't like heights, right, right, what better way to, you know, live at the high building and kind of force yourself every day to go out on the balcony. So I think those are some really good tips. What other practical tips do you have for parents out there? Um, And I'm going to just load up more. One on going back to our first question is how do you know if your child is anxious? So we kind of talked about it earlier at the beginning, but um, I do think that a lot of us parents don't know. We don't know where normal falls. So how do you know? And then what tips would be, do you have of your, you know, top of the list that kind of would be easy for all of us listeners to kind of hold on to in our heads or, or write or jot down? Yep. Great. So the first thing is, what are the signs of anxiety? And so one of the things, like I say to parents is, uh, are you noticing that your child is not doing what other kids their age do? Sleeping in their own bed and they're 10 years old, let's say. Um, answering questions in class when they're called on. Um, going up and in, you know, hanging out with friends or with even the cousins at the bar mitzvahs or the parties the family has. Do you find that your child is shrinking away from things, is avoiding things, is dropping out of activities that they used to do when you made them do them, but now that they're 14, it's like, I don't want to play baseball anymore. Why? And it's okay, some things change, but figure that out and, and, and ask, why don't you want to do these things? And of course, think about if they're staying, sleeping in the room with you or have the lights on and such. So you've got to look at those kind of signals. You also have to learn um, to listen to what the teachers aren't saying. Oh, you're Johnny's mom. Yes. You know, he's so quiet. I don't even know he's in my classroom. He's doing fine. All of his work's turned in. Whoa. (laughs) Wait a minute. What do you mean you don't know my kid's in the classroom? And what does that mean? That means Johnny's not talking in class? Isn't mixing it up? So we want to, you know, watch for those signs of avoidance, of dropping out of things. Are they crying? Are they upset? Are they clinging to you and getting you to do things for them? Are they not doing things that are age appropriate for them in terms of independent, you know, dealings? So those are some of the signs, okay? And kids will cry. Kids will throw tantrums. Kids, especially younger ones, to avoid things. They'll make excuses. I don't go to parties because everybody in my high school of 4,000 kids are on drugs, and I'm not like that. It's like, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) Maybe some are doing things, but not everybody. So you got to ask, what are the excuses for not doing things? Okay, and think about what's rational and realistic versus what may be exaggerated to get them out of something. And then the question, you know, what is normal? Again, you know, it depends on the age. It depends on where you live. You know, what's your community like? What's your school like? You know, is it, you know, when I say are kids going out for pizza after school, but if it's not in a safe neighborhood or something, you always have to put things into context and think about that. What to do. Okay, this is the number one thing I'm going to let parents know, and it doesn't matter if the person is seven or 70, if they have anxiety, they haven't learned how to soothe themselves. This is really and truly, and think about the friends you have who can't be alone, that if they are in a taxi, they're calling you. If they are in a grocery store line, it's like, forget it, I can't stay here, I'm leaving. They don't know what to do if they're home alone at night. They're, you know, that every TV and lights on and they're calling people nonstop. It starts very young that you have to learn self-soothing. This is where parents should walk out of the bedroom before the child falls asleep and, you know, have things like teach them how to put themselves back to sleep. You know, is there a, do they need and want something soft and fuzzy? That's fine. But we want them to learn how to soothe themselves. So when they're upset and they call now on the phone and they're hyperventilating, it's like, breathe. When you start to breathe and you calm down, we'll talk. But don't try to convince them that they are going to be calm. They've got to work it themselves. So this is number one. I would teach them as parents. I, I teach my parents of kids how to do deep belly breathing and practice that with your child before they go to bed at night. And I have parents do it before you go to school in the morning. Deep, slow breaths that go slowly down your windpipe and blow up a balloon in, the, in your tummy. That's an inhale. And then exhale 
to let the balloon, ex the air out. Inhale, exhale. These belly breathing, deep breathing is a, a wonderful soother they could do anywhere and people don't even know they're doing it. All right. Other tips. Let me ask you as parents to think about when you're doing something and you're messing up, what's your inner voice saying to you? You're and just idiot. as it, yeah, <laughs> what, right? You screwed up. <laughs> exactly. Now, if you were with, um, you know, someone observing someone and they were screwing up, how would you tell them that didn't work out and how to change it? Would you say, you idiot, why did you do that? No, you know, so this is what I want you to think about is your child needs to learn to have an inner voice to say, whoa, what's happening here? It's not going the way I want, or I'm afraid of this, but hold on. What can I do? Let me stay calm and let me examine this. That's a dog. It is barking, but it's behind that fence. I can keep walking by and it's going to be okay. And I could even go across the street, but I don't have to turn around and run home. You see, they've got to get a voice that coaches them to assess the situation quickly, stay calm and say, how do I manage this? The teacher called on me. I don't have my work done. Oh my gosh. Do I break out into tears and leave? No, I say, I'm sorry. Can I talk to you after class? You know, give, you know, help them problem solve. So this is what we call the internal coach, recognizing what's happening, what's realistic to do, and then show that I can. We call these stick tasks. This is the other thing. Get practice in dealing with the situations that are difficult for us. And like you said, we have to get kids into the situations, but not throwing them in the deep end of the pool. We break things down into a ladder of success small steps all the way up to the big steps, let's say. And so that's the other thing. Give your child plenty of opportunity to practice doing the things they're afraid to do again and again, and getting more and more complicated as you move along. Now, if they can't do this on their own, there's always cognitive behavioral therapy, and we're always here to help, and we're all over the place to try and find people who do CBT. But that also, a therapist, we call ourselves you know, anxiety coaches, coping cat coaches, you name it, uh, feelings coaches, because, you know, we don't want kids to feel stigmatized by what is a normal emotion that, again, sometimes runs amok. We're big advocates of CBT at Psych Hub. We actually do a training um, for providers on CBT for adolescents that we collaborated with Columbia on. <laughs> so, um, so, so we, we do believe in it so much. I, 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 Fear that part of the problem, because all of this is so helpful. And for parents, sometimes we know what to do, but there, it, there's some work that the parent also has to do because we value ourselves in, and I've seen this, I did over a decade in private practice as a therapist, as a psychotherapist, that we, I'd see parents who would value their parenting skills and how good they are as a parent by how comfortable their child was, right? If their child was uncomfortable, then they weren't doing their job, especially people who gave up careers to be stay-at-home moms. It's almost like if this is my full-time job, my kid has to be perfect because I sacrificed for this. And, and these are real first world problems, I understand. But I think it plays into the anxiety of that helicopter parent. So I want to make sure we impress that on parents is like, let's also take a step back and look at how do we value success as a parent and having our child have no anxiety may or, may, or taking care of everything may make us feel good. But that may not be what's in the best interest for, for our kids. So I really like the things that you have mentioned. I'm like looking at, I wrote down, took notes while you were talking, which is the self-soothing. And um, I know I did the Richard Ferber method with all three of my kids. And I was mean about it. I was like, at six weeks, I was like, but that was because I learned about self-soothing in grad school. I had that gift. And I remember Richard Ferber, uh, we, we did like a, lecture with him and, and heard his guest speaking. And he talked about if you could learn how to self-soothe, 
when you're a baby that, you know, you can self-soothe at, throughout life. So I, that really resonates with me. And for all of you parents out there, that's a, I haven't heard self-soothing connected with anxiety before, but it makes perfect sense that self-soothing is so important. And what that really means is you got to let your parent, your child be a little bit uncomfortable so they can learn how to make themselves feel better. And that's work for you. And maybe come up with some things that you can do during those times where it's super anxiety provoking for you. Um, somebody recently sent something to me about, what is it? Person, place, and thing, right? So it's like either if you know you're going to be in a tough situation, find someone, a person that you could talk to to distract you while you're letting your child have to kind of uh, soothe themselves. Or I'm not the expert on this, but I just know about this self-soothing thing or a place, like have a place that you could go to take a break from your child. But I think the self-soothing thing is so important for parents. And the deep breathing, um, I, I feel like I'm just really learning about that. And you're right. That is an in the moment thing that a child can do or an adolescent can do to help kind of slow, slow things down. But let's talk about the really difficult one is what are you, what do you do? Now we know parents are going to have a hard time doing this and we know this is hard for kids, but what do you do for the child who doesn't, who doesn't want to take care of it on themselves, who, who resists and doesn't want to put themselves in the situation that's anxiety provoking. And they resist so much that it almost is exacerbating to the parent and they just kind of give up because they don't want the conflict all the time. Well, see, that's, that's like right on the money for where we have a youth anxiety center program. And that is really for our 18 to 28 year olds whose parents have given up over the years, because as, as the child ages and gets more, you know, they get uh, older and they get bigger and they get more combative in a lot of ways and angrier about being pushed out of the house to do things. Uh, what, I mean, at the end of high school, the, the diploma does not give you a get out of anxiety free card. It's just a diploma and you don't have to do anything after that. There's no compulsory go out to college or go to work. And so parents then throw their hands up because their anxious young adult is not wanting to do anything. And they get really, they feel very helpless. And it's a, okay, we've got to learn how to step back, whether it's a parent of an, a, you know, a 20 year old again, or a 10 year old, we've got to step back and say, look, the youth has to try and come to their own internal motivation in some way. And with you having some guidance or incentivizing it, that's, that has to be there, okay? And and the second thing is, it doesn't matter how old they are. There should be expectations for things that they do for themselves that has nothing to do with anxiety. A 20-year-old who is too anxious to leave the house, that there's no anxiety about they can't do their own wa- uh, you know, laundry and they can't make dinner for the whole family if you're going to work every day and they're just staying home. A 10-year-old who's too anxious to go to school and they are staying home or missing more days than that, there's nothing that says they shouldn't uh, be able to clean up their room and put to- you know, their toys away. There's always responsibilities that they should have in the home that helps them learn that they have some agency. They can contribute and they need to contribute and not that mom and dad are there to just you know, be at their beck and call at all times. And everything gets mixed up with anxiety because what happens is it does get mixed up. It's like you said, I'm ineffective in managing my anxiety, which means I also am not going to do anything. I'm just going to be miserable and sit in front of a computer. No, we've got to back that down. So it has to start that you have to look at what do you provide at their age that they really want and will be contingent on them doing some basic things in the home to get started that they earn their, you know, computer time or they earn spending money or whatever. So you have to have that. And then the second thing is, what are the things that you're not going to fight with them about, but you're also not going to indulge them on? So we're not going to fight over whether you help yourself. I'm not going to fight with you on that as long as you um, are going and seeing this doctor or as long as you're doing this online anxiety course, which there is. There's the Camp Cope a lot for younger kids and there's lots of programs on Silver Cloud for older uh, and young adults and older adults. 
all dealing with anxiety, depression, and such. It's that if we see you're making some gains to help yourself, we're going to meet you with giving you some things that keep you at basic level, but we're not overdoing it. You don't have access to the credit card cart launch. You don't have that. You could just get up and eat the Ben and Jerry's out of the refrigerator anytime you want during the day that you're not going to school. Mm -mm. So you really have to, you know, engineer your environment and always stay in control of the house as parents. It's your place. And some of this, again, comes from learning how to do reflective listening, listening to the youth and not judging it. Just I hear that you're upset. I can hear how that will make you very anxious. I hear that you have panic attacks when you think about going into the school or counselor or going to see a, a therapist. I, I hear that. Let's talk about that. You're telling me it feels terrible. Tell me more. And it, by not judging and just listening, they do start to talk. They then break down. And again, without judging, then you're like, let tell me this. Is this working for you? What, what do you think? You ask them, what do you think we should do? Because we're not going to be here forever. What do you think we should do at this time? So you get engagement with them. That's fantastic. I, I think that's a, a really easy nugget too for parents to grasp. So, and it's also something you can practice because you know, you know, it's coming, right? You know what, I I bet any parent of an anxious child knows exactly what it's like when their child is anxious. So to be able to take a little bit of time and to practice on, you know, when they, and it's okay if you screw it up, right? But when they come in to do that reflective listening, to just listen and then kind of repeat it back, that's, then they almost have to own, the child has to own what they're saying. And I know, I'm sure you, you experience and then kids will say, no, that's not what I'm saying. And you're just like, well, I'm pretty sure that's what you said, but no, you don't, don't get, yeah. but you don't get, you know, judgmental on it. So I think yeah. for our, for all of us parents, that's a great, that's a great, really good first step. We know that it's coming and, and when it comes just to change our behavior, I always like that expression, you know, the same behaviors mm-hmm. yield the same results. So it's important to kind of change the behavior. And then I love where you talked about, you know, you can do these different things, teach the teach the um, deep belly breathing. You can really work with your child to push them into what they're anxious about in small doses. Um, I don't know if there's, is there uh, research or do you support doing rewards around that to help? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, a, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, we have CBT for child anxiety is the most well-researched and we go all the way down to age three. And like I said, all the way up, depending on the age, the rewards are stickers. I mean, stickers for little kids. I had a, I had a child who came in was sleeping with the parents every night. The father was going out of his mind. He, he used to travel and he'd come home and that kid's in bed. Anyway, long story short is he promised her this like Barbie playhouse for the backyard Um, If she just slept in her own bed, I said, no, no, hold on. I took out a sticker chart and I said, (laughs) you know, and I, and I said, listen, if you sleep in your bed all night and you get up in the morning then and eat the breakfast mommy and daddy make for you, what do you want that you would want to eat that you don't usually get? And she's like, I want Fruit Loops. I said, okay, you sleep in bed all night, you eat whatever they give you. And then I took a Dixie cup out. You get a Dixie cup with Fruit Loops. This kid was like, oh, she did it. (laughs) That's so great. You know, kids will work for these things. And, you know, so you have to, we do have to use incentives. As they get older, the incentives, though, are more around the privileges they want. Yeah, that's that's where I was going to kind of drill down on because I think that was, that's an interesting pivot. And in the beginning, you know, you can do that incentivized to try to kind of get them more comfortable with their anxiety. And I would have to imagine too, that when somebody can overcome an anxiety, that helps them overcome other things in their other life things. too. Gives them confidence to go out and try new things and, and, you know, gives them success and all that, which is so important as we think about all the risks we have to take in life. But when we get to that difficult case where you have a child and in a certain sense, the child has won, right? They've kind of dug their heels in and getting them to go to school is just so difficult. I love the way that you poise this where it's not, you're not going to punish the child, 
but that they have responsibilities on them. And it isn't just a free ticket of my, because I, I worry so many times, and we've talked about this a lot on our podcast about diagnoses and how yeah. so many people wear diagnoses and then it, it owns them. And it's That's like, right. well, I, they reify it. This becomes yes. who I am. I'm exactly. ADHD. No, you're not. You know, you're Brian and you're inattentive at times. And I, yeah. So I love the way that you frame this as, okay, that's a piece of what you're doing right now. And, and maybe there's no control over that, but there's other things that, that a parent mm-hmm. has control over. You live in I my house. Give, yeah. I want to give you three things for parents. Okay. The first thing is that we want to let, we want to use privileges to leverage, not that parents get into this trap she doesn't go to school or she's got so much anxiety, but all she loves is going to ballet. So we let her go. She stays home all day, doesn't go to school, but she does go to ballet class. Wait a minute. <laughs> These are the kinds of things I want parents to stop that, step back and say, you've got to bear in mind that, you know, you're reinforcing staying home from school by letting her go to ballet you've got to say, you've got to at least go to one class a day to keep, to have ballet. And if you don't go to one class at school a day, you can't go to ballet. And it's got to be this thing where you, you move it up two classes, three classes, because otherwise then parents are afraid she's got nothing else or he's got nothing else. So I have to let him go to the rock concert, but he's not, you know, doing these other things. So that's one thing bear that you're not going to harm your kid by putting some limits as to what they freely do. The second thing is you got to let natural consequences sometimes take hold. Don't finish the homework for the child. If they don't get it done and they don't get it done well or get it in on time or whatever, the natural consequence, let the teacher deal with it with them. Okay. And then we see this with children who are perfectionists, have generalized anxiety issues or obsessive compulsive. You know, we have to, we as therapists leverage natural consequences of what they do. It helps us to teach them how to rein in some things and manage behavior. And the third thing is, this is so important. You got to live your life. Parents who stop living their life to accommodate their kids that's where the anxiety infuses all of you. You, the parents who stop working, those you know who can stop working, or they never go out to dinner because their kids won't go to sleep without them just staying at home. They don't go away. They don't leave the child with a babysitter. Oh my goodness, you've got to do things for you, and you've got to take care of you. So that first, putting that mask on you first, the oxygen mask before you put it on your kid on the plane. It's the same thing in everyday life. You have got to live your life so that you can be there for your kids and be refreshed. And then when your anxiety meter is like, because your kid's upset, you can ride that wave more easily and be ready to help them problem solve their way through it. Incredible. I I know that this is going to help so many parents. I mean, this was really just, it helped me. It was just really, you're brilliant and so needed. Yeah. And, you know, these are, these are tough challenges, you know, and as parents, we just want to do the best we can. And we don't, we don't always know. And I just am so grateful for your wisdom on all of this. Well, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate this. This was great. My pleasure. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.